Hey, this is Mike McGinley. Troy Blakely. Mitch Rose. Peter Katzis. Mike Hayes. Tony from APA. Vince Bannon. Sean Healy. Steve Rennie. And Rick Canny. Sam Kinkin. Rob McDerf. Happy to be here on Promoter 101. Promoter 101. Promoter 101. Promoter 101. Welcome back to Promoter 101, episode 38. I'm your host, Dan Steinberg, joined once again by Works Entertainment, Luke Pierce. And welcome back to the States to you, Dan. For everyone out there, Dan spent the third week of this June in the UK. I saw some pretty epic picks from Stone Roses, and we're going to spend a little time breaking that down a little later in the podcast. So for now, let's get to it. There's an incredible podcast in store. We've got the longtime manager of Dire Straits, Mr. Ed McNell, is going to be with us later. Internet sensation, musician, comedian, Agni Spagnola is on the podcast talking about her successes online in our Power Hour drinking theme recordings. And we're going to get some legal advice from Denver attorney and Levitt Pavilion board member Dave Ratner. And we'll be joined by C-Ticket's Steve Overman for three questions. Hi, I'm Michael Yerke from Live Nation. I'm the president of talent for House of Blues Entertainment at Live Nation, and you're here at Promoter 101. Dan and I are hitting the road this fall. Promoter 101 coming at you live starting again this September. Thursday, September 7th, Promoter 101 comes to the Western Arts Alliance in Seattle, Washington. Featured guests include ICM Partners, Andrea Johnson, and the Triple Doors, Scott Jampino. On October 12th, Promoter 101 will be at the Berkeley Popular Music Institute in Boston. We're firming up guests, and we're excited to share them with you in the coming weeks. We're closing out this amazing year of touring of the podcast around the world on Monday, October 16th, as we'll be doing a live recording in Nashville from the IEBA conference. Oh, the guests we have lined up for this one, let's just say it now, gonna be epic. Very sad indeed that IEBA will be the last of the live recordings for Promoter 101 for 2017. Dan and I, after all, do have some business to look after, but we're already looking forward to the 2018 schedule. If we haven't hit your town or your conference yet, don't fear. More is going to come. If you have any thoughts or feedback about the podcast, we'd love to hear about it. Send us an email at steiny at promoter101.net. Keep up with us on Twitter. I'm at W. Luke Pierce. Dan's at the Jew. And the show is at Promoters 101. Be sure to subscribe to Promoter 101 wherever you podcast. And please help us spread the word by telling your friends. Hi, it's Ken Deans. I'm here on Promoter 101 with Steiny and the crew talking about all sorts of great stuff. It's time for the news of the week. A few moves in the street. NASDAQ moved on June 22nd to delist Robert Silverman's latest company, Function, which is trading over the counter at around 26 cents per share on Thursday. And characteristically, Silverman said his latest project is still on an ascending timeline despite its poor cash flow from servicing its crushing debt. Sean Parker's out as a board member at Spotify. Parker, according to Music Business Worldwide, is stepping aside so that four new members can join the board in advance of the much-talked-about direct listing on the New York Stock Exchange. He'll still have his $650 million share in that company to keep him warm in that. Bill Cosby, fresh off his mistrial, is planning to do a speaking tour. That's going to have to be a hard pass for me, Luke. First, Dan, did you see Cosby doing a fat Albert impression, the hey, 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 as he left for day two of jury deliberations? I mean, what is going on in this guy's mind? Is he completely lost it? We've got to post that video sometime this week on our Facebook page. The guy is a lunatic. I think it's just a really tragic story. Everybody loved this guy growing up and to see the uh, true colors coming out, supposedly, because he hasn't been convicted of anything, but a whole lot of people saying it makes you think it's probably got to be pretty close to the truth. Indeed. Encore is reporting AEG is looking to step up their game in Nashville with a major new venue complex, sounding very similar to LA Live or the London O2 setup. So based on the photos and designs they sent over to Polestar, the yard, as AEG is calling it, it's going to extend Nashville's lower Broadway scene further from the river down to maybe 9th or 10th Avenue. It's an exciting development. We're going to have to keep our eye on it. The Star Plaza Theater is calling it a day and closing its doors after 37 years. CEO Charlie Bloom had left the Star in February, and the 3,400-seater in Maryville, Indiana, is set for demolition later this year. Charlie's got his hands full with his management gig these days, but he clearly was the heart and soul of that venue. Last week, we had some technical issues between our sound and editing. We quickly got them resolved, but we're very sorry for anyone that had some issues with last week's episode. We got them fixed, and uh, we'll try really hard to avoid making those same mistakes again. 
Sean Edson. I work for At Venue and head up our music partnerships, and you're on Promoter 101. Dan, anyone following you on social media knows you crossed the pond this week. Spent some time in the UK. How was London? Yeah, I'm a massive Stone and Roses fan, and they sadly only played five shows, and all of them were in the UK. So my oldest friend Grant and I hopped on a plane to catch him in London at Wembley Stadium on June 17th, and then again in Leeds on June 20th at the First Direct Arena. Great show. Band lived up to the hype. Mad shout out to Simon Moran and the entire SJMT team for hosting us. We also checked out the Pink Floyd exhibit at the Victoria and Albert Museum. When rock and roll meets history, you got my attention. This is totally worth checking out if you have a chance. And we also caught Jim Steinman's Bat Out of Hell, the musical at the London Coliseum. Production is off the hook in this show, and Meatloaf's music like I've never heard it before. Big thanks to John Harper for taking care of us on that. Sounds like you had an incredibly full trip. Of course. Also found time to hang with some of my favorite people while across the pond. I loved my time in the UK. It just always flies by so quickly. Big thank yous to Toby, Jake, and Carl, Leighton Pope, and the entire Leighton Pope family, Chris Prosser, Tom Wilridge, Tony Bennon, and Steve Zapp for making time for me for an unforgettable trip. Frank Wing, APA, Nashville, Promoter 101. Wishing from Promoter 101 a few happy birthdays this week. Monday, concert promoter Mark Lambinette and insurance promoter Paul Bassman. On Tuesday, Promoter 101 wishing a happy birthday to Point Entertainment's Jesse Lundy, Live Nation's Sean Striegel, Rick Wetzel, and Atlantic Records' Harlan Fry. On Wednesday, Paradigm's Lee Anderson. Friday, giving a big happy birthday to our buddy at Access Pass, Seth Sheck. Also, Tristan Law and Data King, Alex White's big happy birthday. Saturday, Brian Luther and Live Nation's Denise Ross. Happy birthday to all from your gang at the Promoter 101 podcast. This is John Schultz. I'm Windish. Charlie from Crescent Ballroom. Craig Newman. Dave Brooks. Dave Chumley here. Dave Ratner. John Holiday. Ted Becknell. LX. Imong Shaw. Kelly Lesko. Gerald B. Henley. Harlan Fry here. Jack Ross. Jason Miller. Jeffrey Fox. Joe Escalante. Blair LeBlanc. Martin Atkins. Neil Dixon. Nick Farkas. Paolo Palazzo. And I'm on Promoter 101. Promoter 101. Promoter 101! Time to check in on Promoter 101 Tweets of the Week. If you're not following Dan, please be sure to check him out on Twitter. He's at the Jew. When a manager only seems to work on Saturdays. It's a service business. Always amazed by managers that tell me this, but don't provide any time to their artist. Never shocked when these guys get fired either. When your promoter rep calls in to tell you that this is the least professional act we have ever booked. Well, I guess somebody has to be the worst. Congrats, you are. When a manager and an agent cannot agree on a venue. I love this one. Agent. Challenge. Me? Okay. Next day, it cleared. Manager. We're not playing there. Me. Wait, what? When it takes a venue more than two weeks for a final show accounting. This post is about a week old and I still haven't had the funds or the final paperwork. Amazing. Three weeks out now. That does it for Promoter 101 Tweets of the Week. Be sure to follow Dan at The Jew on Twitter and the show at Promoters 101. This is Mike Hayes with ICM. You're on Promoter 101. One of the most asked questions both Dan and I get is, how do we pick our guests for Promoter 101? So we thought we'd spend a little bit of time this week breaking down how we program this podcast. The answer is pretty simple. We ask ourselves three questions. Does this person interest me? Does it interest Luke? And would it interest our friends in the business? If the answer is yes to one or more of these questions, we set up the interview. If it's no on all three, we don't. We do our best to cross-program from all different parts of the businesses in the world, for that matter, with the hope that we'll show as much diversity as possible while keeping the show entertaining and educational. We try to keep it balanced so we don't focus on one agency over and over again. And we do our best to spread it out all over the majors, as well as the independents and the promoter side of things. Same thing with ticketing companies and, of course, the labels, too. We try to give a divergent uh, perspective from all across the board. Keep in mind... We cannot force anyone to talk to us, so we look for willing guests. Without forcing the issue, it's always better to have someone that wants to talk to us and enjoying the experience. And we also prefer to do interviews in person, wherever possible. It just makes for a better piece, better production. So we spend a lot of time programming ourselves at conferences all around the world where we'll go in and grab a bunch of interviews 
in advance and use those throughout the next two or three months as we wait for the next conference. We're also open to people offering to be on the podcast. Showing interest makes our lives a lot easier. So while we don't always interview everyone that sends a request, we do try to engage everyone that sends interest in. So, for example, Dan designed three questions, which is a segment that allows us to bring in guests in the industry that are on the rise. With that in mind, if you have any ideas of who you'd like to hear on the podcast, feel free to tell us at promoter101.net. Even if you personally want to be on the podcast, don't be shy. We love hearing from people that like the show and want to be involved. With that said, Luke and I will be recording interviews in New York City, July 17th through 19th. If you're interested in being on the show, drop us an email at steiny at promoter101.net. Yo, this is Tommy Lee. Yeah, that T. Lee. And you're listening to Promoter 101. Fucking turn this shit up, bitches. It's time once again for three questions where listeners come on the show and get to ask Steiny and I any three questions they'd like. That's industry, personal, whatever they want. Most importantly, Dan and I haven't seen the questions in advance. This week, we are joined by C-Tickets, Steve Oberman. Promoter 101, we're joined on three questions this week from C-Tickets, Vice President of Business Development, Steve Oberman. Welcome, Steve. Thanks for having me on, Dan. Cool. So what do you got for us on three questions? Dan, this is something I think about every day. How can we in the ticketing business make your lives easier? We are always looking for ticketing companies that are promoter friendly. That means great technology, easy to work with technology, customer friendly. And I mean customer not by the promoter or the venue, although that is also helpful, but friendly towards the public. I want to make it as easy for the public to buy tickets as possible. Ticketmaster and Ticketfly have figured this out. We want to make things as easy for our public to get the ticket bought. As little hoops to jump through as possible. Same thing while setting up tickets. Making it as easy as possible to get things on your system and on sale. And making it as easy for the customer to find the show in your system and purchase it. The more hoops that we put up there, the harder we make it for them to buy them. Luke, you got any thoughts on that? On my front, I would just love a little bit more transparency and ticket company policies in regards to fan clubs and getting artist allocations uh, set for their fans. I've been a pretty vocal proponent by the changing goal lines that are set by companies like Ticketmaster and Ticketfly in regards to what I can pull off platform to service to fans. You know, it's frustrating to go into a lot of venues when I have artists with, you know, 12 to $15 tickets that are playing clubs for the first time be applied, uh, you know, a 1395 Ticketmaster fee. And I want to be able to offer an allocation of tickets where I can offer a, uh, you know, $2 service fee on some third party service available to, uh, to fans. I just, I just don't think that's necessarily right. So, you know, it's, it's been quite a process to define what, rules you need to to adhere to in order to get your tickets off of that platform onto a third party service. That's one major area that I can, you know, probably attest to to some headaches too. The other area too would just be, you know, transparency and sharing of data. There's a lot of things that a lot of third party consent forms that need to go in for me to put a conversion or a universal pixel on some, you know, confirmation page for me to be able to retarget or market to fans. And that process needs to be streamlined or or whitelisted in some way where it's easier for marketers and managers to go in and start collecting data from some of these uh, transactions so that I can, you know, move forward uh, supporting my artists. Awesome. Any other questions for us? We're both dads. I'm wondering how that affects your life as a promoter. Are there any shows that you do that you wouldn't let your daughter go to no matter how much she begged? Oh, wow. Yeah, that's a great question. Yeah, there's absolutely content that isn't meant for my 11-year-old. So, yeah, there's adult shows that we do that that would never happen. I mean, we promoted Ron Jeremy for years. And while he's a fine individual and I don't mind him around my daughter, I would never allow her to go to his show. On the other side of that, there were kids shows that we do now that we never did. Reese got me into the business of doing imagination movers, which led to Yo Gabba Gabba and brought us into the world of Daniel Tiger and Shopkins, Peppa Pig. So we have a whole division of business that came from being a dad now that without Reese... We wouldn't probably do any of those shows. The world of being a dad. 
It's like you get excited about buying Peppa Pig tickets as if it's the Rolling Stones. What's your final question? When I go to the conferences, I find that the worst panels are the ones where everyone just agrees with each other. The best ones are when people will challenge each other's assumptions and argue with each other. If you were going to put together a panel, who would you put on there to guarantee that there would be fireworks? Luke, you might want to go first. I think putting Frank Riley and any promoter on a panel would certainly cause fireworks or Frank Riley and anyone from Hook Entertainment right now for, for some fireworks. But if we're asking for an answer for an everyday scenario for it, I would challenge any music tech person against ticketing or um, you know, even to a degree – uh, venue versus ticketing people as well, too. I think that the tech folks are going to offer a really unique perspective about ways that businesses are run outside of music, and they continually challenge assumptions of people working in the music business. So putting some sort of tech presence on a panel is probably good to disrupt across the board, uh, no pun intended. Okay, well, for me, this is kind of a loaded question because I feel I have the best panels in the industry, bar none, when I do them. And Polestar, Billboard, IVM have all been very good about letting me build the panel I want with whoever I want. And that's what you're looking for. You're looking for people that are going to have different opinions and they're going to be willing to stand behind them and argue them out in front of their peers. So big personalities that understand the job inside and out. And when they're not arguing the rules, but arguing the exceptions, both sides know exactly how to fight that. So I'm always really big on that. I mean, an Andrea Johnson, always money in the bank on a panel. She knows her job and can deliver it with perfect dialed in sniper like arguments. That's what you're looking for. People that like know their job, are respected, and don't want to take any bullshit. Louis Messina, also great at this. Never afraid to challenge someone, knows the point, willing to drive it home, and will argue his point no matter who's in the room. That's what you want. That makes for a good and entertaining panel. Thanks for playing three questions. We appreciate it, Steve. Thanks, Dan. Thanks for joining us on Promoter 101 for three questions, Steve. If you want to be the one asking three questions on an upcoming episode of Promoter 101, please email us. It's tiny at promoter101.net. Hey, it's Mark David. Steve Strange. Toby Layton Pipe. Stuart Galbraith. Simeon Galperin. I'm Ralph James. Ted Cohen. Julia Frank. Jeff Goodman. Jamie Adler. And Frank Wing. Doug Edley. David Klein. Stephen Riff. Tom Chauncey. And, and we're, we're on, on Promoter 101. 101. Promoter 101. Promoter 101. Promoter 101. Very excited about this week. Dan caught up with former longtime manager of Dire Straits, Mr. Ed Bicknell. We're at ILMC. It's uh, day one, and I'm joined in the seat by Rick Nell, who's got to be one of the better personalities in the business. Thank you so much for giving us the time. My pleasure. If I'm one of the better personalities, it doesn't say much for the rest. <laughs> So you get to interview Paul McGinnis, former manager of U2, while we're here this week? Yep. Yeah, on Friday. It'll be the 15th interview I've done here. It's not really an interview. It's more of a conversation because I just don't ask questions. I just talk and they get try and find a space to fill in. <laughs> well, that should be a good conversation. But I've, I've known him for many, many years and we traveled a very similar path because I managed Dire Straits from 1977 to 2001 and he managed you 2 from 1978 until, I think, a couple of years ago. And we would, you know, we would kind of crisscross and we would bump into them in hotels and I would tread on Bono and I couldn't see him and uh, <laughs> things like that. So we've known each other a long time. And we've also fought a few of the same fights with kind of collection societies comes to mind. And he's been very vocal on internet providers and and i'll ask him a bit about that and for the shortest possible time i can get away with i'm going to ask him about secondary ticketing and what's your feeling on that to me it's got nothing to do with ticketing it's ticket touting it's an electronic version of a guy who's eight feet wide coming up to you outside a venue going do you want tickets do you want tickets it's just the same nothing's going to happen about that until governments pass laws which are enforceable to prevent it Every year, this event, 
and all the other similar events, Polestar and the rest of it, it tends to dominate the proceedings. But people go away and they come back again the next year and they're talking about exactly the same thing. Because the only way you could really stop it as it currently is, is if you had an act which could literally play up to its absolute demand level because secondary ticketing or touting or whatever you want to call it is a consequence of supply and demand. And if the supply was greater, there would be less room for the secondary stuff on top. But acts can't do that. I mean, with Dire Straits, we used to play runs in the same venue. We once did 22 nights in the arena in Sydney in a straight run. Really? Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah, I know. I lost count. And I was talking to the hall manager one night, and he said, you know, you could have played 40 nights here in terms of ticket demand. You can't get artists to play up to the demand. So the, the problem will always be there. It's almost Keynesian economics in a way. Well, it seems like with adding the new VIPs and some of the Ticketmaster Platinum features, yeah. where the acts are now controlling more of the prices of the better tickets to make sure that those revenues go into the pot towards them opposed to the secondary market that's going to help eliminate some of that i'm not active in the music biz in the current sense so whereas i'm aware of that if i were to have to take on a big band tomorrow it would probably represent the biggest headache no that's not true the musicians would be the biggest headache <laughs> but after that the secondary ticketing would be like a nightmare to me because i take the view that the audience are being scammed and they're being scammed really badly it's not just the f what they pay for that ticket what they pay for that ticket means they can't spend that money on something else so there's a kind of knock-on effect to other acts as well if you're having to pay a thousand dollars for a ticket instead of a face value of say 150 there's probably five more acts you're not going to be able to go and see and so that there's a trickle down effect so you're killing the other bands' marketplace? Well, you're not killing them, but I'm just saying it's all part of an interrelated thing. It's not just as straightforward as saying, I got ripped off, I had to pay $1,000 to see Adele, for instance, or whoever it happens to be. And I know lots of people who are trying really hard to circumvent this. Rod Smallwood and Iron Maiden are doing uh, paperless ticketing, and you have to go along with your passport or your ID. Or uh, The problem for them has been massively reduced. Springsteen was doing something similar to that as well. Mm. It just really slows down the egress well, of into the shows and is expensive. Yeah, of course. But to me, the audience in popular music, ever since popular music kind of got going, or certainly by the time the 80s came round, the audience was kind of, to me, being ripped off. And I'm using a very generalized, subjective word there. But it, it would start at the car park and it would move to the hot dog stand and then it would move to the seat and, you know, and all this kind of thing. I don't know why people go to shows. I, I don't go to shows, and I can afford to go to shows. I don't go to shows. It's such a load of grief. I'll go to Ronnie Scott's Jazz Club here in London, which is 250 capacity, where I can see the act, hear the act, get a decent meal, and have the possibilities one day of perhaps being a shareholder in the club. <laughs> but the idea of going to the O2... The last time I went to the O2 was to see the Zeppelin show, which was what? The reunion show? 2007, I think that was. Yeah. Okay, when well, that's a once in a lifetime kind of thing. Well, actually, so I'd sense. put Zeppelin on when I was at college for £100 in 1968. Where did you go to university? Hull in Yorkshire, north of England. And I ran the entertainments there for two years, 60, 67 through to 69. It was a great time to be doing it because there was a whole school of acts coming through. We used to call them underground or progressive or whatever you want. But the kind of acts that I was able to put on there, I had Jethro Tull, 10 years after, The Who, three or four times, The Moody Blues, Zeppelin, um, Muddy Waters, John Lee Hooker, John Heisman's Coliseum, The Kinks, Family. The best band I had by far was Family. Really? Probably unknown to most of your listeners, but great band. Check out the records by Family. <laughs> um, and that was just, they were just the bands on the circuit then. I mean, I say that to you and I see you looking slightly agog. Well, the, but they the were band's just, names were amazing that you yeah, just listed but they were the acts that were doing that circuit. And a, and a Saturday night at a student union where you could make three or four hundred pounds, English pounds, back then, that was a big payday. So you're talking about a club size capacity, right? I had a hall that held about a thousand. And I, it was about, I think it was the third biggest student union hall in the UK at the time. Leeds, where the Who did live at Leeds, being another 
and a university called in the northeast called Lancaster. So I had a bit. I had a big hall, and I was and Sheffield University, which was kind of quite close by, would take acts on a Friday. So sometimes we do a Friday Saturday, and we'd get somebody to come up and do those two days. That was just the time. I mean, there are acts out playing colleges and clubs now who maybe 30 or 40 years from now, people will be astonished to know that they were playing at Joe Bloggs Club for a thousand pounds, say. It's just what the time was. And also the fact that a lot of those acts did go on to, you know, major long lasting career success. And many of them are still with us. So is that how you got involved in the businesses through college doing shows? The involvement started when I was 14 and I, uh, started playing drums. And I always wanted to be a professional drummer. I had no aspirations to be on the business side of music. I didn't know what the business side of music was. It wasn't called the music business then. You didn't think in terms that you, of making money. You didn't even know that you could. I mean, I knew that Elvis Presley and the Beatles had done well. That was it. That, literally, that was it. I didn't know that you could make a living, let alone become staggeringly wealthy, as some of my colleagues are. <laughs> Did you have any success as a drummer in your bands? I was successful enough to get fired from the average white band for not being Scottish. <laughs> now, my host is laughing. He thinks I'm making a joke. <laughs> you're no Scots, you're oot. I ended up in a band which called Mogul Thrash, which became the average white band. And I wasn't good enough. I mean, I make a joke about it, but I wasn't good enough. And fortunately for me, thank you guys, they sacked me. And that got me onto the business side because quite by accident, I bumped into an agent the, literally the next day on Oxford Street here in London. And uh, he'd been one of the guys who tried to sell me bands when I was at university. And he asked me what I was doing. And I said, I've just been sacked from this group for not being Scottish. And he said something which some of your listeners may have heard over the years i can't pay you anything but <laughs> so i went off to work for him for on based on half of everything i earned for the office and the first day i got there which was the next day he said oh by the way i forgot to tell you i haven't got any acts so i had to go out and find some acts and fortunately about three months later uh, the phone rang and i might add it was the one phone that we had we had to share a phone <laughs> and i picked up the phone and a voice came on and I'm not going to do the accent, but the, vo the voice said, hi, this is Miles Axe Copeland III, <laughs> which turned out to be Miles Copeland. And Miles was looking for somebody to book Wishbone Ash, who at the time were unknown. I went off to Miles's house in North London and saw Wishbone Ash play their, they played their entire first album to me, sitting in armchairs, which I thought was quite neat. <laughs> and uh, we took them on. And then Miles came into the business and within a, two or three years, we had like the third biggest agency in London. And I worked my way up through a couple of other agencies. And by 1977, I was working at Brian Epstein's old company, NEMS. And the Beatles. Well, yes, Epstein had passed away and the Beatles were long gone. But I was working with a guy called Steve Barnett, who's now president of Capital Records this week, I think. Yeah. Hi, Steve, if you're listening. That was kind of when I sort of hit the inverted commas big time. Because I was looking after Deep Purple, Black Sabbath, Fat Reg, which is Elton John to your listeners. Fat Reg? Fat Reg. Was that his stage name? No, no. His real name is Reg Dwight. We used to call him Fat Reg. <laughs> we had Nazareth, the Alex Harvey band. I did the first European tour for Steely Dan. I can't remember all the artists. Yes. We had the group, yes. And I'd, through a whole convoluted set of circumstances, I'd ended up looking after all of the sire records artists which were the ramones talking heads richard hell and the voidoids flaming groovies and the dead boys you were booking them yeah i was booking them for the uk and europe yeah most of those were handled by frank barcelona in the states right yeah probably i know talking heads were this was very early on in their careers okay and in 78 the talking heads were coming back for what was their second tour in january of that year and i needed an opening act and i had 50 pounds a night to spend on an opening act and a friend of mine at Phonogram Records called John Staines, who's now uh, living and working down in Austin, Texas, he called me up and basically doing a hard sell on this group he just signed called Dire Straits. 
And he got me to go around to their offices. It was a Friday evening, I remember. And I was setting up a tour for Richie Havens, if you remember him. Great guy. And he played me that the, the, there was a demo tape that they'd made that had four songs on it. The first one of which was Sultans of Swing. And I listened to this tape and thought it was pretty good. And you have to remember, I was listening to it in context of looking for an opening act for the Talking Heads. I wasn't thinking about management or anything like that. And he said, typical record company, let me take you for a slap up meal next Tuesday. They're playing a club in North London called Dingwalls. So the next Tuesday, I found myself in a really horrible kebab house <laughs> watching this lump of meat going around with fat dripping off it. And we went over the road and they were already playing when we went into the club. And there was one thing that made got my attention. It wasn't the music and it certainly wasn't the presentation because there was no presentation it was the fact that mark was playing a red fender stratocaster guitar which to me was a completely iconic thing and you'd have to have lived in britain and after the second world war we there was a ban on bringing electronic uh, instruments and stuff into the uk and it wasn't until the early 60s that american guitars came over here and there's a buddy holly and the crickets album called the chirping crickets which is Buddy Holly's playing a Fender Strat on the front cover. And we had a group here who's still going called The Shadows, who were our version, if you like, of The Ventures. Those are, or Dwayne Eddy, those American instrumental bands. Right. And the guitar player with The Shadows played a red Fender Strat. And Mark was playing a red Fender Strat. And I turned to this record company guy and I said to him, uh, he's playing a red Fender Strat like Hank Marvin's, who's managing this band. And he said, nobody. I said, I'd like to manage them. Based entirely on the red guitar. If he'd had a blue, <laughs> if he'd had a blue Gibson, I'd have walked out. <laughs> Again, our host is laughing because he doesn't believe me. I'm serious. I believe you, but this guitar, the color and of this I, guitar I've, changed your entire life. Absolutely, totally. And I've, t I've told that story to Jeff Beck, David Gilmore, <laughs> Eric, Eric clapped out, all of them. And they get it instantly. Well, of course they do. And actually, when I mentioned it to Mark, after I'd known him for about four months, and I said, you know, the only reason I wanted to take you on was because you had a red strat. And he just kind of laughed and he said, well, it had to be red, didn't it? He understood exactly what I was talking about. It's a very British thing. I think um, an American audience wouldn't necessarily understand that for us growing up in the UK in the late 50s and 60s, uh, America was a really kind of like a magical place. And we got our information about America from the early TV shows like Dragnet and the 77 Sunset Strip. And we got it from album covers, both the front cover the pictures of people, you know, you'd see Buddy Holly with these glasses and you'd think, wow. And then you would turn the thing over and there'd be sleeve notes. And Martin Offler, for instance, can recite word perfect the entire sleeve note for Elvis's Gold Records Volume 1. And I would have a pretty, pretty good crack at that as well. We've been talking about how that's changed in our industry that now there's such a back and forth with the acts because of their website and their well, Twitter it's the same feeds thing, yes. and Facebook. But now the album art's gone away. But we would put the albums on even when I was young. And I'd put Van Halen 1984 on and I would study every part of that album cover yes. to the point where I knew Ted Templeman was the producer of that album. And everyone else that of that genre could tell you if they own the album, yeah. they could tell you One everything of the things about the album. People are going to think this is funny, but just mentioning Martin Offer again. Mark has a thing about the smell of guitar brochures. He would write off to get a free brochure for Gibson guitars or Fenders or whatever it happened to be, and the brochure would arrive. And I would be doing the same for drum brochures, for Ludwig or Slingerland or Rogers or whatever. And when you took it out of the envelope, the paper had a very particular smell. And uh, we would spend our time sniffing brochures, not bicycle seats like the rest of your audience. No, we smelled brochures. And uh, <laughs> I'm not understanding why, but okay. Mark and I were once in Nashville and we were having dinner uh, with Waylon Jennings, the Everly brothers, Willie Nelson, and I think Amy Lou Harris was there. And we were describing what we're talking about. Talk my coolest dinner ever, but yeah, go on. Well, it was cool because I was there, but... Um, <laughs> But we were having this conversation about how in the UK our access to American culture was through these very narrow channels at that point in time. It was movies, and you would go and see an Elvis Presley movie like Loving You or Jailhouse Rock, which was like a long video. It was Because nobody was making videos then. We would have the TV, early TV shows, and we'd have 
album covers. And it's interesting that vinyl in this country has made this is now the biggest selling uh, sound carrying format. And I think one of the main reasons is the artwork thing. I had a conversation with Chris. I interviewed Chris Blackwell of Island Records fame a few years ago, and he was saying how important uh, artwork was to him, how he started copying the Blue Note jazz records. And now people have, you can get books of Blue Note covers as artwork. Artwork was a very evocative kind of thing for us because if you're kind of, if you're sort of starved of any other you, you know, one of the things for instance i remember mark and i talking about when we were in nashville with that group of players was our fascination with finding out who played on records who played on the phil Spector records because they didn't list them who produced elvis presley felton jarvis wasn't on there chet atkins wasn't on the sleeve and guys like hal blaine and uh earl palmer and all the musicians who played on the uh, early rock and roll records these and you were... couldn't just google it at that no, point no, you, guys, there was no... you had to find it absolutely you had to sort of go on a quest and then you found out that the drummer on be my baby who's doing that great lick boom 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 blah boom is the hal blaine who's hal blaine now i have a hal blaine's email address and he never answers me <laughs> but um, when we actually g kind of started to make it in the States, and I don't just mean with Dallas Trace, I had other artists that were doing well there, uh, Jerry Rafferty being one, Baker Street. and uh, Way down the line. And Brian Ferry and people like that. Meeting, I'd never really got much out of meeting big name pop stars. You know, I didn't care about that. But when I got to meet the players I'm talking about, you know, Jay, I, I remember being in uh, Australia with the Straits and uh, John Denver was there with James Burton and um, Glenn Hardin from the crickets and that. We were like kids. We were like sort of groveling. If James Burton had asked me to lick his boots clean, I'd have been down on my knees. As an honor. Yeah, absolutely. It's amazing. So Jerry Rafferty, did you manage him or did you no, I managed book him? him? Did he have ever a live touring side? Yes. Because he seemed to be yes a really no. elusive kind of yeah. performer. I think... You know, sadly, he's no longer with us. I looked after him for about six or seven years and including the very successful period, the Baker Street record, City to City album and the one after it, which was called Night Owl. We did do some touring over here. We had a really good band who were essentially the band that was on that City to City record. The two of the best songs in rock and roll ever. Well, yes. Um, and <laughs> I don't know. I'm trying to think of the other songs in rock and roll. <laughs> Millions of them. He was quite shy, and he was quite a private person. We did come over to America once, not for the purposes of playing live. We did a television show in New York called Headliners, which was hosted by David Frost, and we went out to Los Angeles, and the record company in Los Angeles did a complete number on him in a very, very L.A. way of the time. Your listeners will have to imagine what I could possibly mean by that. He did not enjoy fame or celebrity at all. And he retreated from it. And he basically uh, bought a farm down in the southeast of England. And he went there and he kind of pulled up the drawbridge, as it were. And he wrote songs and he made records and he stopped performing, which I was very sorry about. I mean, I had, I will say this, I had, I booked five American tours for him. or I had an agent do it and he cancelled all five one of which was on sale, and then I dropped him. You can only apologize so many times. Well, it, it was just getting frustrating. You know, in, in, when you're a manager, the essence of being a manager is you, you work with what your artist gives you, and if they're not giving you things to work with, then be better off using your time with the many people who will do that. I mean, all of the acts I've worked with, probably, and he would be the exception, sadly, had a great work ethic. I mean, so people who might not even be known in the States, but pe but they w worked hard and, and nobody worked harder than Dire Straits did. We would do show runs of 28 days without a day off. And, and it would, nobody would even think about it. I used to book tours because I didn't use an agent for the Straits outside of the US. I did it all myself. And I booked tours the way that I'd grown up booking tours. When I was booking Deep Purple, Deep Purple played nine nights a week and nobody <laughs> in deep purple ever said we want the day off you didn't do it it wasn't done that way now bands do you know three gigs a week and they fall over pathetic <laughs> with the straights we would do i'm not saying we would necessarily do 28 one-nighters 
we might do multiple. We were sufficiently popular that we could do multiple nights. So, for instance, when I mentioned that venue in Sydney, which held, I think it was 14,000, and we did 22 nights there, we weren't doing load-ins and load-outs and stuff. I mean, Mark Martin Offler once said to me, he was looking at a date sheet, and he said, there's a day off here. And he was pointing at this day off. And he said, what's that for? I said, it's for the road crew. Mm. <laughs> on a, and on that particular night, and this is not a joke, the band turned up at a wedding reception at a hotel in the northeast of England and played at the wedding reception. They walked in and they said, where Dire Straits can we play at your wedding reception? And this, this couple went... <laughs> So they just got up with the local instruments, what the dance band had or whatever, and they played. They oh, and the I, I, I played, um, you were talking about my drumming and that. I remember we were playing in Greensboro, North Carolina, which is just the best town. And um, we had a night off. We were staying in the Holiday Inn. I remember it because it was opposite an enormous sign on the far side of the road which said, learn to massage a nude girl, 50 cents. And... Mark and I and a couple of the roadies were sitting in the bar and they had a nice little bar band and they were playing Sultans of Swing and they didn't know we were in there. And Mark turned to me and he said, yeah, we can play this better than they can. And he got up and he went and stood right in front of the guitar player. There couldn't have been more than eight people in this bar. And the guitar player is doing all the posing and he's throwing his head back and he's playing that solo section at the end, the very fast bit. And so a looked, live cover band in the bar yeah, is yeah. playing Dire Straits yeah. with Dire Straits in the bar. Yes, yes. And the guy looks down. Not knowing it. And Mark's looking up at him. And he's going... And they stopped. The guy, they just, they, they, they just kind of fell to bits. And Mark said, can we get up and play with you? And they went, uh, uh, yeah. So I got drums. I think our saxophone player was there. We didn't play Dire Straits songs. I mean, come on, give me a break. <laughs> we, we, we just said, does everybody know Green Onions, Booker T and the MG? Right. And we all stomped into that. Because there are certain songs that every act ought to know, even if they don't. The fundamentals. The absolute basis. Yeah, everybody should know how to play Little Richard songs, Elvis Presley songs, Bo Diddley songs. They're not difficult. And once you get into the groove... You just have a lot of fun playing them. And then it was funny, this bar filled. <laughs> but the, half an hour had gone by, there were 500 people jammed into this bar. It was amazing. Bar. Yeah, it was good fun. The band often did that. There was Nobody was precious about uh, playing with other musicians. And people would ring me up at the office and say, sometimes and, and they'd say, you know, would Martin Offler play on such and such and such? And I said, yeah, probably. Send me the song. And Mark's attitude always was, if I can bring something to this song, I'll play on it. Why not? He's a musician. He's not, you know, I don't know if people ring Justin Bieber up and say, will you come and sing on my song? Doubt it somehow. But when you're a player, or, you know, D uh, Bob Dylan asked um, uh, Mark and uh, Pitt Withers, our first drummer, to play on the Slow Train Coming record. And then Mark subsequently produced the Infidels record for D Dylan. Who, incidentally, we, we, we refer to as uh, Rambling Sid <laughs> to his face. Is there Dil a story? Dylan has no idea what we're talking I think he thinks we're probably talking about Rambling Sid Elliot, but we're not. It's something else. Is there a story behind him, him well, becoming Rambling a, Sid? There was a radio show in the UK that anybody of my generation will remember from the late 60s, early 70s called um, Round the Horn. And it was, a, it was on the BBC on a Sunday afternoon. And there was a spoof folk singer on it called Rambling Sid Rumpole. And he taught it like that. And I'm going to sing you now a song in my southwest English accent. Arr. And he would sing like that. Dum, dicky, dum, dicky, dum, dicky, 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 dum. <laughs> and Mark and I just coined this name for Dylan. And to this day, Dylan has no idea what we're talking about. So going back to Mark Knopfler, yeah. he's a musician in the way that most people aren't. I mean, what he did with the Princess Bride soundtrack is incredible. Not every musician can do that. He's a, a musician of another elk and a higher level. Mm. Is I, that a question or a statement? Well, it's, a if statement it's a statement. If saying, it's a statement, I'll give you $5. It is a statement. But... Um, in 1980, I think it was, he rang me up one day just completely out of the blue. 
And he said, you know, I'd really like to do a film soundtrack. And this was a bit of a challenge for me because, number one, I didn't know anybody in the film business anywhere in the world, zero. And in the UK, we didn't really have a film industry. But I straight away realised that I was more likely to get him a scoring job in the UK precisely because we didn't have an industry. So I only like had eight or nine people to approach as opposed to going off to Hollywood and having 500 people to approach. You could be more focused. Yeah. And I got in touch with the six or seven people in this country at the time who made films. And one of them happened to be David Putnam, who I didn't know this at the time, but in pop music, you need luck and you have to sort of almost create an opportunity for, to, to have luck. And uh, I didn't know this, but David's son, which is a huge Dire Straits fan and was a guitarist and used to play uh, Tunnel of Love from our third album called Making Movies. And when David had a rough cut of a film called Local Hero made, which Burt Lancaster was in, uh, David Putnam had actually put the guitar solo from Tunnel of Love on the play out at the end of the film as like a, just a test thing. So this was sheer luck. I call up David Putnam. He needs somebody to score local hero, and he's already put a Dire Straits guitar solo on the end of the rough cut of the film. So I go over to his office, I pick up the script, I meet him, and he's got a film out at the time, which is just becoming a big hit, called Chariots of Fire, for which Van Gallis had done a fantastic soundtrack, I think. So, and I didn't know about deals, so I just... I won't get into the financial thing, but I asked him for a deal which was absolutely ridiculous because I didn't know what to ask for. And he kind of went, well, we can work that out. And we did work it out, and it was the deal that I asked for. And I sent the script over to Mark. Mark ran me back within probably an hour. He said, this is great. I'd love to do this. And it was set up in Scotland. And although a lot of your audience may not know this, Mark is actually from Glasgow in Scotland. He's not from Newcastle, where everybody thinks he's from. And uh, we went up to Scotland and we spent a week hanging out with Burt Lancaster, which was like a trip, I'm telling you, because he was part of the Hollywood star system and he was quite eccentric. You know, we dropped names like Elton and Eric, Pish. He was <laughs> dropping Frank and Ava. And we're like, holy sh... You know, I mean... and. We had a fantastic time. I, I remember it as being one of the best, one of the absolute career highs in the 27 years I worked with them. And we did the score. And then, of course, once you've done one, other people in the film game take notice of the directors. And then we did another one for David called Cal, which had Helen Mirren in it. Fantastic lady. And uh, I worked with Mark on nine films altogether put together he's not done any since he and i parted company he hasn't done any films interestingly and local hero i believe is being um turned into a musical he's working on turning it into a musical it's been launched at the edinburgh festival later this year i think yeah it's amazing and i don't think you can find another group of musicians where you can just say i want to do films and they could get the concept of scoring a film that's it's a whole nother no, level I, eric, eric clapton's done a couple we've encountered people who I mean, Hans Zimmer used to be in bands and he's now probably the numero uno guy. P Pat Leonard, who's a friend of mine, who produced the first five Madonna records and the last three Leonard Cohen records. Pat's done a lot of film work and is currently available. Um, <laughs> I'm sure no, there's a I number of great musicians that can do them. I just don't think all musicians are good enough to do them. You're correct, and it is quite a different discipline. I, I remember Mark said to me once that one of the things he enjoyed about it was the fact it's the, it was the only occasion where he got to be the employee. In every other situation, he was the employer. And when you're working on a film and the director says to you, I want 27 seconds of music while this guy climbs up the outside of a building. That's a bit of a challenge. And uh, it was an interesting learning process as well. I mean, we didn't know that most films are test marketed and re-edited. So when we did Local Hero, 
uh, we had to do most of the music twice. So you they think re- you're done, they, and then you yeah. Turns well, out... they they recut the film. They went off and test marketed it and recut the film. And they don't snip the film at the end of a bar of music. They just snip the film, and you have to go and redo it. And I think it had a direct impact on the kind of music he made with the band as well, because after the first two Straits records were pretty straightforward kind of American rock and roll records, really. They were guitar based. They were very JJ Cale, Dylan esque type of things. And then on the third one, we added keyboards, which was Roy Bitten from Bruce's band, at least in the studio. And I remember when Roy came into the rehearsal room and played the intro to Tunnel of Love, and I was just standing there. And it was like, it felt like Concord taking off. It just was amazing. Incre- incredible player, great guy, and absolutely got it straight away, what he needed to do. And then we added a, one keyboard player to the group, and then we added a second one. So you've had an amazing career. Most of these extra in the Hall of Fame or will wind up there. Since you've left the industry, what's kept you busy? Well, <laughs> I left the industry and then I came back. Because it's a bit like trying to leave the mafia, you know. You... <laughs> I stopped the management thing in 2001 because, to be quite honest, I'd run out of steam. I was wiped out. It's a very stressful at that level. And to do it at that level for that long does tax you mentally and physically and your personal life will almost certainly be in um, all over the place and I was no exception to that and after I stopped working with Dire Straits had finished nobody's ever said it's finished but it's finished and I would be astonished if it was ever, they were ever to do anything again and and anyway Dire Straits is in the current parlance it's, it's just a brand name for what Mark songs Star Trek was a vehicle for his songs. So when when I stopped, I took a break and I unpacked some of the cardboard boxes I'd been living with for about 20 years. Got my house done up and then was headhunted, I suppose you'd say, to set up and run William Morris here in the UK, hmm. which I did. It wasn't William Morris Endeavour. It was just prior to that. And we set up an office here and we started with a blank sheet of paper Pretty soon I had a lot of machinery and a lot of staff and a lot of assistants and a lot of phone calls in the middle of the night. I did that for a couple of years and I I knew it wasn't for me. I'm, uh, they're a great company. I, and this offer has been completely successful. It's really grown quickly. Yeah, and I have no beef with them at all. Not at all. If I'd stayed a bit longer, I would have... Of course, it all changed when Ari Emanuel and Patrick Witzel came in. And I probably... With hindsight, I maybe should I should have waited, but I didn't know that was going to happen. I think when you've run your own business, this might be something I'll talk to Paul about on Friday. When you've run your own business for many, many, many years and you make decisions often involving large sums of money and you do it instantly in, in the second because you have a kind of inbuilt experience. To become an employee... And particularly an employee of an American company, if you're European, because there is a big cultural difference. I found it very difficult. I found just having layers of people to sort of go through. Do you think that might have been different if it was a European company you're working for? Yes. That's not a criticism of... No, it was an honest question. I think that people in the entertainment business in Los Angeles, sorry listeners, a lot of them treat what they're doing as some kind of religious pursuit and it isn't and there were definitely some cultural issues that i found sense of humor being one i have a very particular sense of humor yeah you've got a big personality but and i think that's one of the no things people I, love about ha- I i have an incredibly small personality but i have a big sense of humor <laughs> i did find it difficult dealing with some of the the more the more <sighs> it's hard to put this into words i'm saying that applied to me i don't saying it applied to the other people who were working there or the people who were working under me but for me having run my own business for essentially over 30 years to suddenly go from that to being an employee of a large multinational corporation which had 450 agents and all the rest of it of course it's grown since and i remember looking down the list of acts when they sent me the list of acts they represented in the music area I think there were over 1,500, and there are certainly over 2,000 now. And I only knew about 80 of them, because I don't listen to much contemporary music. When you're managing acts, you operate in a bubble. You're in this goldfish bowl where you're working on what you're working on, and you're putting 110% of your effort into that, or you should be. 
And I wasn't worrying about what else was going on. And I never saw it as being a competition. I never, for instance, I remember um, when we were on tour, I would do a report every week for the band members and it would be record sales by every territory, chart positions, what single was out, video. And I would shove it under the door. And I know very well that most of the band members, it, it went straight in the bin. They never read them. I remember once doing an interview with Mark and the interviewer said to him, when private investigations got to number one in the UK, what did you think? And Mark turned to him and he said, did it? He didn't know because it wasn't what we were about. That's what the business side is about. I didn't sit around on the tour bus reading trade magazines. I would read the penthouse letters page. <laughs> I mean, it's w billboard or penthouse. Come on. It's no contest. It's hard to jerk off the billboard. So I'm not. Oh, I don't know what you do. Um, <laughs> I'm, I wasn't looking at it. If I was doing it now, or if I was the, of the generation that's doing it now, it, that might be different. But I came into it as a fan. That was totally 110% the reason. Red Fender Stratocaster, fan. That was all it was. I didn't come into it because I thought I could make money at it. I didn't come into it to have an empire. You know, I didn't want my own TV show. None of this kind of stuff. I didn't want to be Simon Cowell, bless him. <laughs> um, I didn't have any of those aspirations. I just wanted to be around music and musicians and the lifestyle. And I have to say that it was driven by lust. People listening to this should make no mistake. The music <laughs> business has been driven by lust for as long as it's been going. Girls. It was about girls and stuff. Because girls are attracted to bands. Yeah, I don't know. They're, they just seem to be around. I can't emphasize it enough. It was the fan thing. And I was the music fan. My mum and dad bought me Elvis's Gold Records, Volume 1 when I was 12 or 13. The first track on that vinyl album is Hound Dog. And I put that on the record player, two minutes, 26 seconds later, boom, that's it. My life had changed. And D Dire Straits was just part of the progression. And, and it turned out that the relationship with them worked, and, and particularly with Mark worked, because he was coming from exactly the same position that I was. Exactly the same. And we're from, we both used to go to the same music shop in Leeds when we were teenagers in the north of England. He would go left into guitars, woodwinds was on the right, and the drum department was down in the basement. It's always in the basement, drummers. We would talk about this, and we were going there at exactly the same moment in time. We didn't know each other. We went to the same shop. We were playing in local bands in the area. Again, didn't know each other. So it just seemed... I'm not a cosmic person, but there was definitely kind of, there was a connection. We knew it the, the moment we met. It was just a... It was Destin? Yes, that sounds a bit... It was a red guitar? But, you know, but most of the managers of my era, I think John Landau would be a good example with Bruce. You know, John was a journalist writing reviews of artists. He was a fan of music. And he goes and sees Bruce and comes up with that. I've seen the future of rock and roll and, it's, you know, that kind of stuff. But we were fat. All of us were fans. Now I go to colleges and I teach this stuff to people who are on courses and they get degrees in it. A degree in rock and roll. Yeah. There are music business degrees. I was interviewing Nick Mason from Pink Floyd here a few years ago. I don't know if you saw it. One of the questions I asked Nick was, I said, do you think it's a bit odd that, you know, when you started out, did you ever imagine that you would be coming to a conference where people go to health and safety panels and withholding tax panels. Well, all we wanted to do was sex, drugs, rock and roll. That was what it was about. I think that's all all of us want to do, unfortunately, at some point along the way, the insurance companies made us learn a couple Absolutely, more steps. Absolutely, yeah. What happened was that in, in a, in a soundbite, popular music was corporatized in the 80s. And it started first with the record companies being gobbled up. They gobbled each other up first, and then corporations like Time Warner came along and gobbled up that, or Sony came along and gobbled up CBS. And then it moved through publishing and finally ended up in the live side, as represented here this week. It's dominated by Live Nation and AEG and a few other players. And when I was interviewing Arthur Fogel here a couple of years ago, I referred to Live Nation as the blob which was a reference to an old Stephen McQueen horror film where the blob gobbled up everything it came into contact with. And that, to me, is what kind of like Live Nation's like. And it was inevitable. It was absolutely, you know, the way it's gone, 
was just an inevitable part of the way human beings are. It's amazing. I think we should finish on that because Live Nation being a blob is not going to get any better than that. And I, I'd love to turn this into an annual thing if we can have you back next year. And do you can have again. me back in five minutes if you turn that off, and then we'll turn it on again, and I'll do next year's for you now. <laughs> That's great. Thank you so much no, for taking the time. It's an absolute pleasure. Ed is really a major personality. Thanks so much for making time for us, Ed. This was an incredible time. Hey, this is Rob McDermott from Mad Mac Entertainment, and you're listening to Promoter 101. This week, we've got internet sensation, musician, comedian, Ali Spagnola here to talk about how she built her online career and a more than 3 million Twitter followers and a dedicated following for her Power Hour drinking themed recordings. Promoter 101, we're in Los Angeles, the Sunset Marquee, and I'm hanging out with a good friend. Allie, thank you so much for being here. Heck yeah, thanks for having me. We've known each other for a couple of years now. It's been a while. And I, I feel like we, we more get to stalk each other on social media than <laughs> right? get to hang out. But That's fair. You have an amazing platform on social media. Your followers' numbers are insane. Let's talk about what you do for the audience that's not familiar with you yet. Cool. Yeah, well, thank you. Yeah, I make art for the internet, basically. Videos on YouTube, I tweet way too much. I recently become really active on Snapchat, so I'm like a life vlogger on there, and the hardcore fans get to see everything I'm doing. They know I'm here right now because of Snapchat. That's kind of flattering <laughs> okay and your follower numbers they're real like it's three million on twitter is that right yeah that's my biggest platform so okay and then youtube is what now around sixty thousand. yeah that's the one i'm focusing on the most actually it seems certainly to be... could be the most financial beneficial in the long run yeah for sure you know that may shift vine seemed like it was headed in the right direction and then then it wasn't so dead on the vine <laughs> you just gotta stay nimble i guess okay so how do you monetize that Various ways for me, it's different than a usual band or a musician because a lot of my stuff, a lot of my income does not come from playing shows or merch. I do brand integrations, which is more of like a social media star kind of thing where companies will be like, hey, you should talk about our product to all the people that listen to you. And then I vet them. If it's it's a good fit, then I, uh, I'll make them a video or tweet about it. So you won't just take or... a check for anyone. It has to be something that fits your brand. Well, yes, because I don't want to anger my audience. And it's not good for the brand either because no one gets anything out of it if it's not a good fit. Like on Twitter, I have a bunch of bros and, you know, it's just dudes like wanting to relive the college life like adult males. And if I went up there and was like, hey, get this face cream. They don't care. I've annoyed them and the brand doesn't get like good engagement. So that's, it's never a good thing. Now, let's talk about that. You do have a brand and your brand is kind of the hang. <laughs> the can, hang. Well, I, that's how I explain it. And I imagine you can do it better. And I remember having an evening of drinking with a bunch of the industry folk here in LA where you were explaining to a lot of them what exactly the show is. Can you oh, explain right. okay, the, the live, live experience? Show thing. Yeah. So I play a live concert that doubles as a drinking game. So when I'm performing, it's like an interactive party where everybody's playing along. And it's based on a drinking game called Power Hour, which I did not invent. And the premise of that is that you just take a shot of beer every minute for an hour. And people have like played it with just a timer, which is super boring. And so I wrote an album of one-minute songs. So now at my shows, every time I change the music, everyone is like, yeah, and then cheers and then drinks together. Now, what kind of venue are you playing this? Because people have got to be getting plastered. <laughs> Honestly, that's like the number one thing the bar owners say to me. They're like, you're going to kill my clientele because it does seem like reckless drinking. But when you come to a show, it's more about like the interactivity and like you know, hanging out and like being a part of the show versus like, let's just get sloshed and hurt ourselves. Yeah. So how much are you drinking every minute? Me specifically or my audience? Well, <laughs> because I'm sober. I got to keep the party going. Yeah. You're the, which is, cru you're the cruise director here. Which is, yeah, which is like some inside info. I just I just gave myself away. But um, unless you come to my show and like really pay attention, no one really realizes that like, yeah, I'm stone sober, like being the MC running it. Just while you're working the show. Right, of course. And then afterwards, I'll get blasted with you. <laughs> but if you're actually playing the game and taking a shot of beer, every time I change the music, it ends up being six to eight. Seven and a half beers, depending upon a ha like the size of your shot It's not glass. ridiculous. That's a night of drinking. Well, it's ridiculous for me. I'm just like a tiny little well, gal. But you're but... doing it in an hour. <laughs> right. Yes, it's in, in an hour. But so... if, you sp if you watch the football game and it went into overtime, yeah. you could put down seven beers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Certainly. It's not too crazy, but 
you know, depending upon your size. And, you know, it does well at the bar. They sell a bunch of drinks like it's guaranteed. And so the places that I'm playing are like bar stage venues. And generally, it's always over 21. Okay, and you're touring this, right? Yeah, well, I have toured the country with it. Right now, I pretty much just play in LA, sort of settled here and and making videos has been more of the focus. But I still like to, you know, get out and just throw parties. So I have one coming up next week. Okay, so when you do the shows... Do you book that yourself? Yeah, I am a one gal band all around. I, I'm my own agent, booking agency, manager, whatever. And so, oh yeah, and I do one-off shows. I'll like fly out for private parties or festivals or whatever. Yeah. You do bar mitzvahs? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Make your kid a man. I think it's great. I think you should come run our industry party at Polestar next year. Like That would be super fun. Industry folks get a little nutty. I'm, I'd be down. <laughs> 3,000 of your closest industry friends getting drunk for free. It's, a, it's quite the throwdown. I think they would fall in love with you. Sweet. Okay, so who's coming to that? You're your subscribers, right? The people that follow you on Twitter and YouTube? Yeah, the people that are in LA. And I mean, it varies. Sometimes it's just uh, people that are into the venue or hear about like the gimmick. It really is a gimmick. And they're like, oh, wait, I got to check this out. I got to go play along. you update the show, right? It's not the same show every time. Right. No, it's different every time. Uh, my album is all originals, but I also now play covers. And the joke is, like, we're a wedding band that just gives up after a minute. Hmm. So we're just playing every song that you've ever heard at a wedding. There's just no, like, all the hits from, you know, 70s all the way to today, whatever. And we have some 60s in there, too. Some, like, serious oldies. But, yeah, it's everything you would, like, want to sing along to or or dance. And um, we stop after a minute. And we switch up the songs all the time. So every time you come, it's just, like, a different mix of hits. And if you don't like the song, it's only going to last a minute. Right, You'll be exactly. into something else. So it's like a piano bar <laughs> with a lot of booze going on that yeah. moves right, right through the hit. <laughs> so you said you had a male-driven audience. Is that pretty much who comes or is it a well-diverse crowd? It's pretty diverse here in L.A. And the male-driven audience is specifically on Twitter because that's where I started and that's what sort of like grew with the Power Hour. Though on YouTube, it's a lot of young women. And I think it has to do with, you know, my content sort of switched up into more like fun, non-drinking music-related stuff. And it varies really. But at the actual concert, yeah, both genders for sure. It sounds like a lot of fun just the interaction with the crowd it seems like more of a variety comedy show than a musical concert, but I know that you are playing live, so it's got that mentality too. Yeah, for sure. It's definitely like a mix of the two. And especially if I do a show that's my originals, all the songs are written like about drinking, just like based on stories from my friends in college. And so they're all kind of just like relatable little one minute jokes that vary in genre and, you know, keep you drinking. A little bit of a Jimmy Buffett met Tina Fey kind of thing. (laughs) Yes, I'll take it. I love that comparison. It's a cool thing. The videos on YouTube and online of what you you doing your show are hilarious. And I got to imagine the excitement of being in the crowd. It's like got to feed off each other in the crowd. It's got to be a fun thing. Yeah, that's what I was going for. It was really like, you know, being an independent musician before doing the Power Hour. It's, you know, it's always tough to sort of stand out and inviting people to my shows. It felt like a chore for both of us. Right. So I just wanted to throw a party and I wanted the crowd to be a part of it. And I, I think I've achieved that. I'm really I'm really happy with how it goes now. Okay, so what are the goals? Right now for me? Yeah, where do you take the social media thing? We work with a ton of acts in social media. On the big side, Miranda Sings, I think, has done it better than anybody else we yeah. work with on the oh, biggest cool. level. But the interaction of her crowd and how she's been able to monetize that from that level on down to some of the younger acts that we're working with, like a Rose and Rosie, where they definitely have that. And you see it's the early days that it's totally coming on strong. But I think this is going to be a bigger space in the very near future of acts breaking on YouTube and being able to monetize that in tour. Yeah, that, I mean, it is interesting because like it is sort of like in a little adolescent period where people like Miranda Sings are now on Netflix, you know, and that's absolutely awesome. And you're right, it's just going to keep shifting more and more. Yeah, Colleen blows me away. It's just like the sweetest person she, in the world and she's built the best vehicle. But if you look at her character and you see the show, it's like the mockery of what her character is 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 this little teenage girl that is overconfident and is doesn't know how to apply makeup and she opens for herself in her live show i'm not sure if you've seen it or not I but That's it's fantastic. amazing that colleen opens for miranda and she transforms in the middle of the show but what you have is this very beautiful woman with a very classically trained voice that knows how to sing and entertain and she dolls herself a song and a half into the show and transitions into Miranda, and the crowd goes nuts. But it's like watching the Beatles take stage at Shea, 
while listening to the crowd erupt to the point where parents ask for refunds because it's too loud and they don't want to stay. Wow. And I when believe the, it. When she the audience army. tears up the room like that, it's amazing. Yeah, it's something that I, I drag industry friends to whenever I do a show. And I'm just like, you just have to see the first 10 minutes. Yeah. And it's just like the first song and they're like, this is a good show. She can sing. She's a beautiful girl. I'm like, yeah. wait for it. Right, and it, she's it, got it really, the look. it really the is only like three minutes in before the transition happens, because yeah. it's like she knows her audience; she's not making them struggle, but she is qualifying that she absolutely can perform at the highest level. And at the same time, she's a good enough comic to deliver what the goods and do mm-hmm. it in a way that it makes it a better joke. I'm beautiful. I'm talented. I can sing, but. I can Jerry Lewis the shit out of this too. And she never actually has to say any of those things because she's so good at what she does that it automatically puts it on the table. Right. And I think that's a part of the reason why she's gotten where she is because she has the talent to back it up. But she's done great things. That's good to hear. I love it. Yeah, she's super down to earth. It's it's a really cool thing to see what she's done. And it's an amazing space because I constantly hear all the time that I want to be the next Miranda Sings. And there's a ton of these artists that are trying and some of them may possibly be that. But I think it's a hard field because there's a bunch of people that want to be famous on the internet that have no chops in front of a live audience and i think that's something that clearly you've built over time by doing shows that when you get the feedback from the crowd and you hear them respond in real time of what they do like and what falls flat that makes it so when you're producing a show and you're putting it on without an audience there you have that feedback of knowing how that's going to go if something falls dead in front of an audience you're not going to put it on youtube right absolutely there's going to be no reaction But there's a whole world of new artists that are doing these YouTube videos that aren't trying it out in front of people. And they don't have that audience experience in front of a live Mm -hmm. crowd to have anything at all, which is why a lot of these things are falling flat. And the other part of them is you have all these people that are putting out minute viral successful videos. They're funny. But then they try to do a live tour. And what's funny for a minute on stage on a viral clip (laughs) doesn't work when you have to do a 60 minute live show. For sure, they're completely different skills. Or even down to like when Vine stars try and transition into acting too. You would think that would be a little easier, but like it's still a struggle. It's, it is a very specific skill, what it takes to, you know, put out a good YouTube video that is heavily edited. And that's a very different skill than like what you're saying, what Miranda Sings does. Now, how do these sponsors find you that want to do product placement? Um, They just reach out via email. I have a business email address that's like findable enough of your, you know, giving it a shot and they'll you know uh, whatever they have to, to offer i'll field it myself i have read too many books on negotiation honestly <laughs> all right well as we're an industry podcast let's not make it too hard for people to find that email address oh right ali at ali cool and we'll put up a link to uh, your twitter feed and uh, your youtube page on the website so people right. can easily find you well thank you as it is one of the harder last names to spell correctly oh, no <laughs> It is just like it sounds. Spagnola, S P A G N O L A. Oh, like Ali's a- hard too. A L I because yeah, because you spell so it six many- different ways. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. Ali Shaw constantly giving me shit for spelling her name differently every time, and still <laughs> never getting it right. It's like live in fear of that. Mm-hmm. Okay, so what's next for you? Oh, right. So I want to be the next Miranda Sings. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> <Touché>, motherfucker. <laughs> Well, I'm working um, actually on a transition to television. So I've um, got a sizzle reel pitch deck. I've been talking to some production companies and I'm working out um, bringing higher production to what I'm making and hopefully a bigger platform. Okay. And has there been any bite yet? Yes, actually. And I was in like a year sort of conversation that did not work out because they wanted like half of my everything once it got down to the deal. So that's, that's a bummer. But I mean, I'm still talking to a bunch of people now and like, yeah, just sort of figuring it out, right? Trying to build the team, right? now like i said i'm a one gal band so uh, you know bringing on smart people that want to help make cool art well it seems like there's a lot of platform for that and there's a lot of people moving into that digital space so i think that you'll be getting the phone calls quickly (laughs) cool that expands but that's a great thing half of everything that's funny (laughs) <laughs> I mean, that's a little bit of exaggeration, but yeah, it was quite an unfair deal. So, you know, well, at least I got a good lawyer out of it. <laughs> but the hope is they expand to the next, to such a bigger level that half of whatever they take right. is so much more than 100% of what you're getting currently. Yeah. That's the pitch anyway, right? right? I guess, yes. I know the, the pitch three, I didn't catch. <laughs> I know the 360 pitch pretty well. Very nice. It's so much bigger than you would have had. You should, you should take it. Right. I'd take it. You should take it. You should take it. <laughs> 
a smaller piece of a way bigger pie. <laughs> and we promise we won't get too involved with your uh, artistic control. Yeah. Too much. That. <laughs> Excellent. So advice for artists getting out there trying to build their social media platform? Yeah, just like Miranda has her little hook and mine is the the drinking game show, like find a way to stand out. There's so many people all stuffed in that room yelling at the top of their lungs like, why does anyone on the internet want to listen to you? Right? Find a reason to be unique. Find a reason that any fan would care. That's fair. How often is the right amount to tweet? I try and do it every couple of hours. I've actually been a little overwhelmed lately, so it's been less. But yeah, I mean, it's it really depends on like what your audience expects, right? So whatever you sort of like get them trained to to know what's coming, you know, stick with it. And, and you've built an audience based on that. So, you know, be consistent. Are you doing different things? things on different platforms when you're doing something on Snapchat? Is it the same thing you're doing on Twitter and on Instagram? Are you spreading that stuff around so it's different content? They're very different. And you have to speak the language of each platform and they're all different. And I mean, it gives people a reason to follow me on each platform too, right? So they'll be able to listen to your podcast, but then they get the behind the scenes of me coming here and that's on Snapchat, right? And then maybe I'll Instagram like at the pool that I just passed and they get to see that, you know, still image that's the album cover of the story or whatever. And so it's like a multi-platform unfolding kind of thing. Pretty cool poll. (laughs) We're at the Sunset Marquee, so... You know, the legendary stories of Zeppelin and the Who and the Stones hanging here at that pool or cool. kind of What can iconic. I catch from that pool? <laughs> hopefully talent. <laughs> <laughs> and hopefully just talent. <laughs> that question may be tainted. <laughs> awesome. So any other advice for artists coming up? The next, what you would advise? Yeah, I see like a lot of trouble with early artists not wanting to say, hey, look what I did. That they want to be sort of subtle or they feel like it's um, showing off or whatever. But really, if you believe in your art show people put it out there tweet about it but instagram a selfie like you are making good work then there's a reason to talk about it and don't be embarrassed by that now you constantly hear that you can't just communicate on your channel by pushing things out that you're selling that you need to be engaging your audience with things that aren't just buy this give me money this way is that something that you found to be true that the engagement is better when you're coming at them with more things than just buy here buy tickets for my show yeah absolutely i mean i feel like i'm consistently off offering things just like in terms of free entertainment like there no one has to pay for my youtube videos although they do that's the source of my monetization right now is patreon if you're familiar with that platform people can donate a certain amount of money or well support me with a certain amount of money each time i post a video and i say to these people you know you can watch this for free and they're like yeah here's another five dollars like <laughs> which is insane but um besides like you know talking about my patreon certainly i'm offering things that they aren't paying for and i don't you know beg with each video and i recently just put out a book that's completely free and um i actually have a project called free paintings where i'll just take requests online and paint whatever you ask for sometimes i'll live stream myself painting them and then i just mail them to whoever asked for it no charge not even the uh, shipping address so you probably asked the right person about that because I am constantly giving. <laughs> no, and there is certainly a reason I want... We don't have a lot of artists on the podcast intentionally because I truly believe that any artist you're interested in, you can Google them and find 5,000 interviews about any artist because I artists speak all the time, constantly, and it's usually the same answers to the same boring questions. But I thought the industry particularly would find you as an artist very interesting because the cutting edge of what's happening on social media and how well you've handled that particularly with the fact that you don't have a huge team behind you like you've navigated and figured that out how to do on your own i think that's so amazing well thank you i appreciate that although it is nice to have you know other people in my corner so that's that's part of the reason why i moved to la is to sort of figure that out so hopefully it'll be a bigger pyramid besides just me (laughs) well and i imagine if anyone's listening that wants to contact you i'm sure we can make that hookup and <laughs> hopefully we can find you an agent and a manager and sounds good feels like actually something that would fall right into luke pierce who's the co-host of the podcast oh, the, cool. his business with home free on youtube is amazing and i think there's some parallels there oh wow cool i'll have to check him out cool so people want to see you're playing next week but the podcast won't air probably till then so there's yeah, something that's that <laughs> that's coming up after that that we can look for that's down the road a couple weeks well in general i'm posting on youtube twice a week so go check out the art that i'm putting there hopefully i'll make you laugh or <laughs> cool and your youtube channel is Ali Spagnola again, just my full name. Cool, you've got the cool URL. Nobody snagged that before you did. Heck yeah, SEO, that's important. <laughs> Very big. Awesome. Thank you so much for taking the time, Ali. Of course, it was great talking to you. 
She is a lot of fun and clearly an artist on the move. Thanks, Allie. Hey, this is Rick Canny from Favor the Artist Management, and you're listening to Promoter 101. Coming up next, helpful music industry legal advice from attorney David Ratner. Promoter 101, we're joined again by our favorite music attorney, Mr. Dave Ratner, joining us on the show. How you doing, Dave? Awesome, Sonny. How are you? I'm excellent. I'm ready to get edumacated. Dude, some of these law terms freak me out. First of all, can you explain force majeure and what it actually matters? Force majeure definitely can matter. I mean, basically, force majeure, the root of the reasons that it's complicated is, first of all, it sounds like a funky French word, but also it is usually a long list of things. And long lists of things in contracts can make them seem more confusing than they are. Basically, force majeure is something out of your control that interferes with performing in a contract. That list usually says, you know, acts of war, acts of terror, acts of the government, acts of God, and weather, and, you know, the utilities failing, all this type of stuff. And these are all things that could interfere with the concert going off. So basically, with it. And it goes on in any contract, with any contract not being performed properly. And it's basically a, a catch-all. And that's why I usually have acts of God in there, because these are all things that are not in your control. So that's, I mean, that's what that long list is. And then the reason it's in there is because when a force majeure event occurs, it releases, or should anyway, release you or the other party from performing the contract. So if because of even transportation, so if your flight is canceled or if the band's flight is canceled and they can't make it to the gig, that is force majeure. That means they couldn't get there. They're prevented from performing the contract because of something out of their control. Okay, but I'm not responsible for paying them in full, even though they tried and they screwed up. They didn't get here because they booked the wrong flight, right? Like we're all able to like lick our wounds, hopefully reschedule, but it's not on us, right? Well, hopefully, I mean, it depends, right? That's why we have the contract. So that clause is also going to say what happens in the event of force majeure. And we want to be specific about it. One of the things we see in a lot of these contracts for force majeure and just for cancellation in general is that you'll see, it'll say if the artist is ready, willing, and able to perform, then the artist still gets paid. So that is something you want to be careful of because yeah, if the, I mean, if the artist isn't there, no, you don't want to have to pay him if you're the promoter, obviously. But if you're the artist and you did your best to get there, you're going to try and get paid. And that's the type of stuff that's going to get negotiated. Got it. So it's all about like really being the artist in any case of the game, right? Well, like you, you and I talked about last time, the really long contracts you're seeing from a lot of the agencies these days. And a lot of those contracts get really detailed and, and they're always going to try and protect the artist and try and make sure the artist gets paid um, no matter what. So, you know, your, your job as a promoter, your, your, your attorney's job is to push back, fight back and, and get the best deal possible and realize it's not just black and white because sometimes, you know, it's a matter, you know, a cancellation, a force majeure will depend on whether the, uh, whether the artist is there or not. If, he, if he's at the event, but it's canceled because the power goes out, right? So power goes out, but the artist is there, he's present, he's ready, willing, and able to perform, then argue, you know, he's going to argue he's, he's going to get paid. But the thing you also want to look out for in these clauses is if there is a cancellation, what happens to any deposit money that's been paid? Right, because sometimes they'll say if X happens, the artist doesn't get paid anything. If Y happens, then the artist gets to keep the deposit. And if Z happens, the artist gets paid in full. And all that stuff gets played out in those in those <laughs> those long agreements that we were talking about last time, or just in any you know any well written contract for you know for performance or something like that. Well, it really comes down to that long term relationship too. Anyone looking to take care oh, of sure. advantage of that scenario versus doing the right thing for the long term relationship is really the quality of the individual you're dealing with, right? Because nine times out of 10, nobody's looking to go to court. Nobody's looking to take advantage. We all want to be in business with each other for a long time. So it's, if everybody did their job, you're assuming the spirit of the deal is going to carry us through and we're never going to actually be on the phone with an attorney. Certainly hope so. You know, I mean, the thing is, it is about relationships, but it's one thing when, you know, it's too well established and, and equally, you know, equally matched uh, parties, but sometimes it's, there's an imbalance. Sometimes it's a, a small time promoter with a major agency or, or vice versa. 
you know, a, a small independent uh, agent who's working with, uh, with the big promoter is going to try and steamroll them. So ideally relationships rule and we're never, never getting the lawyers uh, to fight it out. But, uh, but we, we fall back on the contracts and, and, you know, if you do call your lawyer, uh, you know, the first thing he's going to say is what does the contract say? And that's why we have those things to rely on. And ideally, you know, the contract says what you want it to say. And when stuff goes wrong, uh, you know, it, it, you say, okay, this is what the contract says. We play by the contract and then there's no hard feeling. All right. You got time for one more? Sure. All right. So the term offer and acceptance seems to come up over and over and over again. Can you walk us through the meaning of this? Basic law school 101. If your first year of law school, what you're going to learn is, is that the process of forming a contract is, is an offer and then an acceptance. So, you know, that a contract is formed by the meeting of the minds. And a meeting of a minds occurs when, you know, we have agreement and agreement happens when there's an offer made and the other party accepts the offer. So if somebody um, you know, counters sometimes... with something, they kill the last offer, right? Like once exactly. there's an offer in, if you come back and try to change anything, my original offer is now null and void, right? You can't go, okay, well, I'm taking your original offer before you said no, right? I can still allow you to do that. I'm not on the hook for that once you've like come back at me and tried to change the terms, right? That's correct. Yeah. Because there's an offer and then there's a counter offer and that counter offer essentially negates that, that original offer. So that, that's correct. So every time you change one line in any offer, you're basically taking the original offer off the table. Yeah. I mean, you know, the one line, it depends. I'd say it would depend on how material that one line is. You know, if it's meals for four versus meals for five, is that, you know, does that really make a big difference? Um, but, you know, certainly when we're negotiating the major points of the deal, then, yeah, it'll certainly uh, the, the counter offer takes the original offer off the table. Well, and obviously we all want to do the business. I mean, that's why we're on the phone and sending the offer in the first place. So I don't think the difference between one meal is going to affect wanting to confirm exactly. that day. Exactly. But that's what you say one line. That's what I'm just pointing out, you know. But, yeah, I mean, the, the spirit of it is there. Excellent. I appreciate it so much for you walking us through these, apparently to you, very simple terms. But I think for the world, I hear it constantly. Oh, this is going to be force majeure. We're canceling. I'm like, really? You're canceling? It's force majeure? You've got a flat tire, but you're 10 minutes from the venue? I think we can send someone to come get you. Right. Exactly. And the thing that we, we talk about here is how we don't want to have the lawyers barking at each other. You know, you want to be able to keep it uh, the relationship strong. And, you know, that's why, honestly, it's, it's good contracts, usually in, from the lawyer's opinion, from my, my opinion, a good contract makes for a good deal, right? Like they say, good fences make good neighbors, right? So that you can rely on that contract. Now, if an artist tries to cancel for force majeure and you offer a solution that is completely valid, are they then on the hook for all the expenses of the event if they turn that option down? You do have an obligation when it, when it comes to court, when it comes to law, you have an obligation to mitigate damages. Right. So if the artist can't make it, uh, you know, for some reason, they do have an obligation to try and do their best to make it. Because if you did have to go to court, the, the court would say, well, did you do your best? Did you try and mitigate these damages? One more. And I'm hoping it's quick if you got time for this. Sure. When someone owes you money and you're not sure if they have it or not, and you go through the process of knowing that you're dead to right, you have them and they owe you money. Is it worth going through the system to take them on legally to try and collect if they're trying to avoid you, if there's no money in their pockets currently to try and collect? Is it a long-term future to get paid back slow? Is it worth the process of trying to get in line to get your money? I'd say it really depends on how much money we're talking about because it's going to cost money to go after it. Um, you know, if you, you know, there are, as you probably know, there's collections agents out there um, and there's lawyers who will, who will pursue collections actions. Um, in court and, you know, they're going to take a percentage and they're only going to take something on that's worth their, you know, worth the, the time to make the money. And court can order, you know, requisition of, uh, of, of wages um, and uh, of property and things like that. But it, it really will depend on how severe the, the offense was. And, and the thing is, we can't squeeze blood out of a stone, right? And so it's one thing you, know, you can try and garnish wages when the other party actually has wages. So the party is a, you know, it's an independent artist. They're not getting a, a, a paycheck every two weeks, with, you know, with, the, with a W-2 that's registered. So it's a lot harder to garnish wages when it's not regular payments. So it's really just depend on how much money is at stake and how hard it's going to be to collect it. So say a concert promoter owed you $400. Would you go after that money or if they just walked away, do you think you'd, uh, you'd just let it go? I would definitely want to go after him if it's an artist that's owed money and that, and that money really matters. If I represent the artist, I want to. 
but you know, the court filing fees are going to take up half that money. Again, like you said, you hope you're dealing with an honest player who's going to be fair because they may well know you're not going to pay a lawyer 500 bucks to go collect 400 bucks. You're not going to pay $200 in court fees to collect $400. And so those smaller numbers are hard to collect sometimes because to go through the legal system anyway, it can be prohibited. Okay. So that's what it costs about a couple hundred bucks to file. So it depends on where you are. You know, each state has their own and county has their own filing fees. Now, is the other person responsible for paying those fees if they lose? Or is that your, your cost of doing business? It depends. But here's the thing. Under a certain amount of $400, you can usually take to small claims court. And small claims court is great because you don't have to have lawyers and you can do it yourself. If an artist walks into court with a signed contract that says you're owed $400 and you didn't get the $400, the court's very likely to rule in, in the artist's favor. And you don't got to pay a lawyer for that. The filing fees in small claims court are much less. They could be 50 bucks maybe. Depends again where you are. So that's usually a, a good option for, for, for smaller amounts. Amazing. Thank you so much for teaching us, as always, on Promoter 101, Dave. It's always a pleasure, Dan. Thanks very much. We'll add pro bono law firm to the background of Promoter 101, a little free legal education from your friends here at Promoter 101. Hello, this is Sarah Mertz. I work at Eventbrite, and you are listening to Promoter 101. Never fear, Promoter 101 is going to be back in the saddle at the same bad time, same bad channel next week. Rest in peace, Adam West. We're going to be joined next week with House of Blues' Michael Yerke, festival production mastermind from Bottle Rock and Coachella, Ken Deans, and at venues, Sean Edison. If you have any thoughts or feedback about the podcast, we want to hear from you. Send us an email with your ideas to steiny at promoter101.net. Until next week, may all your shows be sold out. Cheers. Hey, this is Rob Zaffarelli. Addie Ann Tarleton. Paul Lord. Phil Rodriguez. Rick Greenstein. Renata Snatchires. Drew Pellet. Rich Mills. Sasha Bombaji. Seth Hurwitz. Steve Martin. Whitney Bond. This is Trip Brown. Wayne Forte. Steve Zapp. Trevor Solomon. Be live on Promoter 101. Promoter 101. Promoter 101.